If you're like most farmers I know, you really want to raise the prices of your products. You need to raise the prices of your products, but the problem is you don't know how to do it. In today's episode, I'm going to teach you something called price anchoring. And I think that for some of you, if you can use this price anchoring tactic, you're going to be able to raise the prices for everything else in your product suite and start making more money. Let's get started. Hey there, this is Corinna Bench, and welcome to the My Digital Farmer Podcast. In today's market, it's not enough to just grow your product. You've got to know how to sell it, too. Welcome to the My Digital Farmer Podcast, where we reveal online marketing strategies and tips to help farmers like you get better and more confident at marketing. Learn how to find more customers, increase your sales, and build a strong brand for your farm. Let's start the show. Well, welcome to episode 236 of the My Digital Farmer podcast. I am your host, Corinna Bench one of the farmers at Shared Legacy Farms out in Elmore, Ohio. I'm also the founder of MyDigitalFarmer.com, which is all about trying to help other farmers get more confident in their marketing and sales strategy so that you can grow a profitable business online. Welcome back to the show, everyone. How's everyone doing? This should be early November when I drop this episode, and we have just wrapped up our CSA season, and I'm starting to wind things down on the farm. I don't know what it looks like for you, but if you are new to the podcast, I'm really glad you're here today. Make sure that you subscribe to the show if you haven't already, and go check out some of my past archived episodes. There's a lot of good stuff there. Frankly, you could get a really good education in farm marketing just by listening to all of the back episodes. I do encourage people to go check out the first 10 of them, though, especially if you're a little bit green when it comes to marketing, because I did design them to be an onboard into the marketing space. But another great place to go if you want to get like a crash course in farm marketing is to get onto my email list because I drop out one email a week for you for like three months that really walks you through the roadmap of things you need to know. You can get on that list by going to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash subscribe. That's mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash subscribe. Now a word from our podcast sponsor. Today's podcast is sponsored by my friends at Local Line. It's official. Local Line has launched their new and highly anticipated subscriptions feature. Now, creating subscriptions for your customers has never been easier. Subscriptions allow your farm to turn one time orders into recurring revenue. Use Local Line's subscription feature to run your CSA or increase your cash flow and increase customer loyalty. Subscriptions is very flexible. You can add, edit, and cancel subscriptions at any time in your back office and allow customers to manage their settings and add one-off purchases to their orders. You can also offer different subscriptions for different customers, like a standing order for chefs and a CSA box for CSA members. Local Line's subscriptions feature also supports variable weight products like meat and seafood, so you can offer subscription products to all your customers, no matter what you sell. In addition to all of that, Local Line subscriptions is very affordable. You can add it to your Local Line account for just $25 a month. Now, for podcast listeners of the My Digital Farmer podcast, Local Line is offering a free premium feature for an entire year when you sign up using my coupon code. MDF 2023. That includes subscriptions. So why not try it out today? I love Local Line. Head to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash local line and be sure to use my coupon code MDF 2023 to get that free premium feature for one whole year. For more information, check out the link in the show notes. And now back to the show. Today, we're going to be talking about pricing strategies, and this is coming up for me 
because it is the end of the year and I had to spend some time thinking about setting a new price for our CSA product line. And I went through all the things that I'm sure you go through anytime you think about raising your prices. And I've also been doing a lot of internal work on pricing over the last 12 months. And when I say internal work, I've begun to explore the mindset behind pricing and some of the things I believe about money, the things I believe about making money as a farmer and my pricing and how it seems to determine what I think I'm worth. And just, I don't know, just becoming more self-aware of the thoughts that are driving a lot of my pricing models. And as I've been exploring that, I've also been learning a lot about pricing structures and pricing psychology and marketing. And I I find it really fascinating. And so I want to start doing a few episodes here in the next few months on the topic of pricing, specifically on the psychology of pricing, just to open your eyes to to begin the conversation in your mind, help you see things from another perspective. I'm not saying you have to adopt all of this or even necessarily try it out, but some of these ideas were frankly really new to me and I think that you might find them interesting too. If you geek out on marketing like I do, I think you're going to enjoy this. So we're going to talk about setting your prices today, determining what should that price be. And one of the elements that we're going to focus on today, actually the main element we're going to focus on today is the pricing strategy known as price anchoring. And what is that all about? I want to start by telling a story that triggered this episode Last weekend, I took my husband to a concert in Pemberville, Ohio, which is a very small town. It's like smaller than Elmore, (laughs) where we live. They have an opera house, a little small local opera house that they've renovated, and they bring in a different regional band to perform or some kind of musical guest in most cases. We actually recently became sponsors of this opera house because I love the kinds of things that come into this place every single month. I, I think that the, the executive director or the, yeah, I think that's her title, whoever's responsible for finding the talent, she's really, really good at identifying some great talent and bringing them into these small little towns. So we had... We have season tickets, so I just have this giant envelope stuffed full of tickets. But I know that the price for the ticket, if you were just to buy it a la carte, so to speak, a one-off ticket, is in the $15 a person range. And so, you know, we showed up for this band. It was He was called Mike Tolentino, I think. And he did... Um, he was kind of a, a pre-swing band era type band. Okay, so just picture jazz. He was playing a, a saxophone, a clarinet. He had an accordion and did some polka stuff. And he had a group of five guys behind him on banjo and tuba. Like, like they were doing all kinds of really neat jazz stuff, specifically in the area of swing. And I'm a huge swing fan. I actually used to be a swing dance instructor <laughs> in a swing club when I went to Williams College. So I'm a huge fan of swing music, and I really was looking forward to this concert. So I went in with a certain expectation, kind of bring this back to the pricing, actually, this because this is why this story is relevant. Um, I went in with a certain expectation for this concert, partly based on the price of that ticket, and also partly based on the venue, like, who would be the kinds of bands that would be coming to a small little town like Pemberville to perform, right? I just don't have these huge expectations of a powerhouse uh, musical entertainment. Like they're going to be good, but they're not going to be like, oh my gosh, blow me away good. Okay, here's the thing though. They were blow me away good. Like they were so good that they almost it almost felt like they didn't belong on that stage, <laughs> So it ended up feeling like a steal. You know, I'm thinking about, I think my season tickets come to $12 a person. And I just thought, 
I had this moment when I'm watching them on stage and I thought, what if we changed the background? What if we got rid of this stage and we got rid of the opera house around them and we got rid of, you know, the the fold up seats that have created sort of this ambi- certain kind of ambiance and we just st- stuck Mike and his band and plopped him down right in the middle of Radio City Music Hall and put him on that stage instead. And I was trying to imagine him there and he would totally belong there. Like he would totally fit that space. What he was bringing into the room was so good. And it was just this moment, maybe it's because I study marketing and I reflect on this kind of stuff more than most people. But where I said, what if we, what if his, his product is so good that you know, he could have been somewhere else. And the price of a Radio City Music Hall, I didn't look it up, but I'm guessing it's over a hundred bucks a ticket. Um, you know, he would have fit there. And would I have thought if I had seen him in a place like Radio City Music Hall, would I have thought, well, was that worth it? And the answer would have been absolutely. Like I would have paid 125 bucks, probably more than that, if I had known that he was going to be there it would have felt like he belonged at, at that price level, okay? But in this case, in the Pemberville Opera House venue, um, Mike only charged $12 a ticket. Was the performance itself, the product, the, the delivery or the fulfillment of the product the same in terms of its execution? Yes. But would I have felt differently about it if I had paid $125 for that same exact show in a venue like Radio City Music Hall? Yes, probably would have. I would have felt more elevated. I would have, the venue itself and the location would have created additional value, right? Okay, so it, it, it just kind of got me thinking about the role of pricing in setting our expectations for the product. And in this case, I feel like the $12 or $15 per ticket price tag may have actually diminished the value of the experience a little bit for me, unfortunately, even though his performance kind of blew me away. I remember thinking, wow, he, he probably belongs at another level at this point. And I, I don't feel like I have fleshed out like all of the lessons from this story, but when I left that concert my husband and I talked about it in the car on the way home and there were so many things going on in my head like pricing is so subjective right pricing is so contextual and pricing sets our expectation let me share another example of this a few months ago when my family and I went on a summer vacation to Kentucky, you may have heard me talk about this in a previous episode, we we left the farm for five days and went hiking in eastern Kentucky. And we stayed in an Airbnb. I was looking for a house there and I went, went on to Airbnb, looked around, and I remember seeing all kinds of pricing. Uh, The first homes that I was looking at, they were priced at like 400 bucks a night. And I was like, whew, okay. But in my mind, I had sort of imagined that I want to splurge. This is our splurge vacation. I'm comfortable spending this amount of money for the entire vacation. And as long as it fits in that budget, we're good. So, you know, I kind of saw that number and I was like, whoo, okay, well, 400 bucks a night, that's going to be a really nice place. And then I saw some other homes that were like a hundred bucks a night, $125 a night, also perfectly acceptable homes, not quite all the features and bells and whistles. And Then there were some that landed right in the middle, right? There were some that were in the $250 a night or $325 a night. And I I remember thinking as I was exploring all the different prices along the continuum, I remember thinking, what's the difference between the $400 a night one and like the $250 a night one? Or the $400 a night one and the $100 a night one? Like, 
what is really the difference? And is there a marked difference between the two or three that, that are kind of near the top of the continuum or not really? Where, where is this just price coming from? Is it kind of random? And I ended up going with the home that was in the $275 a night price point range. And I here's what I find interesting. I felt differently about that particular lodging experience the whole time we were there. To me, 275 felt like a little bit of an indulgence. 400 felt like a little too much, but I wanted to feel indulgent as part of our experience. And so that 275 was sort of in the middle, a little bit above the middle of the road after I compared all the pricing options. And so it it ended up giving me this feeling that I was splurging a little bit. We were being indulgent. This was a nicer than quote unquote average place. And that is the feeling that I was going after. This particular house was going to do that for me. Now here's what was going on psychologically in my head, and I didn't even know it then. That $400 price point that I saw first communicated to my brain what the quote unquote high roller table was, right? This is where the the hot shots live. This is the upper level. And that number kind of grounded, it was a stake, it was putting a stake in the sand. And then from that number, everything else sort of filtered in my head, like, okay, what is acceptable to me based on that number? And so I was then comfortable with the $275 a night number because I had seen this higher $400 a night number. The $400 a night price tag was serving as a price anchor for me. Everything anchored off of that. That was a little too high for me, but suddenly that $275 a night thing was perfectly acceptable. Now, here's what's so interesting. Like if you had asked me three years ago, if I'd been looking around for vacation spots or, you know, when we were traveling cross country to go to the Grand Canyon and we had to stay in a hotel every night, I remember I was hunting for the Motel, you know, eights or Super 8 hotels, whatever. I was looking for that $125, $150 a night type hotel. And a $275 a night experience, I would never have considered it. Like that felt excessive to me. And so here I am telling this story and the upper level excessive number was $400 a night. And now $275 suddenly feels okay. It's so interesting how in one context, a price seemed high. And in a different context, that price ends up feeling like middle of the road and completely acceptable, okay? This is because there is such a thing as price anchoring. And that is what we're going to explore in today's episode. What is price anchoring and how can it work for setting prices in our own farm business? So we're going to unravel kind of the mystery behind this powerful psychological concept and hopefully we're going to understand how it influences customer perceptions of your brand and we're going to look at a lot of real life examples uh, from farm uh, from actual farm products but we're also going to look at other industries and how they use it too because I think these are all helpful for you to see how is this being done in the industries around us in the world around us and how do we then apply it to our own types of farm products. Okay, so it's a little, a little bit of um, marketing training on on pricing strategies that are used in the big wide world and are we using them in our own industry? Okay, so let's first just uncover and talk out price anchoring a little bit more. What exactly is price anchoring? So this is actually a psychological technique where consumers use an initial piece of information to make subsequent judgments. So it's almost like The pricing sets, the first price that they see sets a mental benchmark or an anchor upon which customers base their future decisions and how they feel about them. So this price anchor can be a high, 
initial price, which creates the perception that subsequent prices that are often lower are a better deal. So it just gets, it, it pre-frames their mind and gets them to be more comfortable with the price that you actually want them to spend. So the psychology behind this is simple. Humans tend to rely heavily on the first piece of information offered when they're making decisions. That's what they base everything off of. So if we send them a price that's jacked up, that's pretty high, that becomes their anchor, that becomes the stake in the sand, and then they make their decisions based on that. Suddenly you you send a different price that's a little bit lower that maybe would have felt high had they not seen the first high number, but because they already saw that really high first number, the second number that you present to them doesn't feel quite so strange because the first number was the anchor, okay? So when applied strategically, price anchoring can really influence how customers perceive the value of your farm products. Okay, so let's just consider, let's consider this. When when customers encounter, I'm gonna try and make this a little more relevant. When customers encounter an anchor price, let's say for a premium farm product that you have, their perception of what is reasonable and acceptable pivots around that initial number. So even if the second price that you show them is then slightly lower, customers are gonna be more likely to view that second price as a fantastic deal because the first one was so much higher. Now this also works on the flip side. If the anchor price that you put out there is set low, any subsequent higher price might feel unreasonably expensive to them, leading those potential buyers then to opt for the seemingly better deal. So it, this price anchoring is all about shaping perceptions and guiding, guiding your customers toward the choice that you want them to make. So if you want them to land and buy the, the, the $75 product, then maybe you anchor uh, a product at $125 and then present the $75 option because now that feels like a deal compared to the $125 option. Is this sort of making sense? I'm gonna give you a bunch of real life examples to show you this in action because this is done everywhere. So if you just look at the electronics industry, for instance, when a, a high, I'm just I was thinking of like smartphones because I just had to buy one. <laughs> when a high-end smartphone is first introduced, it usually comes out with a pretty hefty price tag. And with that high price tag, it sets the standard, that's the anchor, for what consumers now consider to be a top-tier device. And that's really all it's supposed to do. That's why they make it that high price because they're anchoring. They're just doing the anchor piece. If you look in the hospitality um, sector, like luxury hotels. I was just talking about Airbnbs, but like when we go traveling, luxury hotels often present their most expensive suite first in the online, in, in the store. So if you've ever gone to try and book a hotel, I don't know if you've noticed this, but they will put their highest price. That will be the first thing that they show you. And a lot of times when I see it, I'm like, whoo, that's crazy. No. But then when I see this, the prices below, those are probably also kind of high and would have seemed high had I seen those first. But because I'm not seeing them first, I'm seeing them second and third. Now they don't feel so bad, right? So by placing the most expensive hotel suite at the top, they create a benchmark that makes their other rooms appear more affordable. You guys, this is happening everywhere. I'm sure that as I'm telling you this story, you're thinking, yeah, Oh my gosh, yeah, that they totally do do that. And I have felt that way. So I'm trying to point out like pricing is so subjective. Pricing is so contextual, okay? And it has the ability, the way that you do pricing has the ability to change how your customers can feel about your products. I'm gonna pick on Amazon because I know a lot of us do shop there however you feel about Amazon. Um, But Amazon uses brilliant pricing strategies that influence our buying decisions like big time. So I want you to picture this scenario. You're browsing Amazon. You're searching for a new pair of, I don't know, headphones. 
I keep thinking about electronic stuff. Um, what you might not realize is that amidst all the, the variety, the array of choices, Amazon will strategically employ this price anchoring to guide your purchasing behavior. And I want you to pay attention to this now that I'm highlighting it for you. The next time you go and buy from Amazon, I want you to see this at work, okay? So just consider there's this series of a lineup of headphones displayed on your screen on Amazon, okay? And on the left, on the left, it'll be the first one. There's a budget-friendly option priced on at 30 bucks. But on the right, a high-end pair will be listed at $300. You guys go check me on this. You're going to see this happening. Okay. Oh, but wait, there's a third option right in the middle. And it's going to be priced at like, I don't know, $75. Have you ever wondered why that mid-range option seems so appealing? Well, it's that magic of price anchoring that's working on you. And I don't know about you, but I do often end up buying the one that's in the middle because I'll look at both options and I'll be like, huh, well, that one that's really expensive, like that's not even like in my ballpark. So forget about that. But I don't want to get the cheapest one because maybe that one isn't as good, right? Like I'm thinking lower price means not as good. So maybe I can find one in the middle because that's going to make me feel like I'm kind of getting some of the benefits of high expensive but I'm, I'm not all the way down. At least I'm not all the way down at like super low, low budget because I don't want to feel like I'm there, right? So I end up taking the one in the middle. It's sort of like this happy medium choice. Okay, so Amazon, like they're, they're so savvy. <laughs> they use this price anchoring tactic to steer customers towards the middle option. That is what they're trying to do. They're steering you through their pricing strategy. They are steering people to the middle option. That high-end price is the anchor. That's why it's there. They don't expect a lot of people to take that. They want people to take the middle option, and this is why they put an expensive price anchor over on the right, okay? So when you see those $300 headphones, the, the $75 ones suddenly appear, to be a fantastic compromise. It is a, a balance between high quality and affordability. Now, in reality, if you had just come into that space onto the website search result page, you might have only intended to spend around 50 bucks, but the presence of that $300 set of headphones nudged you toward the $80 pair. And it made you feel like you were getting a premium product at a reasonable price in the process. That's what's so interesting when I think about this. Like they are making you feel a certain way with the price. So this this is not some accidental tactic. This is a meticulous thing that Amazon crafts. This is how they they craft their product listings. They are strategic about placing items with varying price points to influence our perception of value. So, my dear farmers, <laughs> what can we learn from these types of pricing strategies that Amazon and other um, online retailers are using? So you can implement price anchoring on your online platform as well. So when you're selling your farm products online, or even if you're at the market and you've just got plain old signage, like we're going to talk about some examples now about how consider presenting your premium offerings alongside your standard ones and create a clear distinction in the quality and the price. And I want you to try, I'm going to challenge you this week to try practicing, just maybe test this. It's going to feel uncomfortable, but just test it. Set a high anchor and in doing so, your goal when you set that high anchor for one of your prices or one of your products is to actually not expect a ton of people to buy that, okay? So don't feel bad if you don't have a lot of people taking you up on that offer. You know in your head, I'm setting this price over here because what I really want to do is guide my customers towards this product over here 
and I want to sell more of those, right? You're going to be highlighting that particular product. You're going to make that one appear not just affordable, but exceptional value for the quality, okay? This this is sort of the goal that I want you to play around with, or at least I want you to think about maybe trying this out as a strategy. This podcast is sponsored by the Thriving Farmer Podcast. Today, we are starting the Farm Business Minute with Michael Kilpatrick from the Thriving Farmer Podcast. For the next eight weeks, Michael will be sharing a quick farm business tip. Let's dive in to the question of the week. Well, Michael, welcome back. Uh, Today, I want to ask you another farm business question. When do you hire your first team member? This is a big one. Yeah, typically I always say yesterday, but <laughs> that is uh, that is actually not necessarily true because if you a don't know where your profit is in your business and you don't know what you're producing and you don't know what you want to be as a farmer, then frequently hiring people is only just going to burn money. And so before you hire, we like to really be clear on you know what we're producing, who the customer is. And, you know, what we, what we want from our business. And so that's where we try to do a lot of, you know, checking our goals, checking our, our systems or processes. And then we're like, okay, we actually now can identify the level one jobs on in the business that is, uh, that anyone can do. And then we're going to bring a person on to hire for that. When I say level one, typically that's things like that are very easily repeatable. So to me, level one is harvesting, washing, bagging salad mix. That's very easy. It's You can describe it. It can go in an SOP. And then someone can out, go out and repeat it again and again and again. Now, when I, you know, like level two and level three, level two to us on our farm is more about equipment. It's more some level of autonomy and decision making. It's more of like managing the team. Um, and then we go from there with different positions and such. But once you start identifying those initial lower level uh, jobs and the ones that are a little bit easier to accomplish, that's when you want to bring someone in because you really want to be working on your business, not in your business. And harvesting that salad mix is is basically in your business, just you know, cutting and bagging and washing that salad mix. Working on your business is going out and getting new um, uh, t- um, customers, or it is actually building your dryer green spin or your bubble washer. So, you know, those are the kinds of differences. And when you start to configure, if you're standing there washing salad mix two, every every night for two hours, okay, now it's time to bring someone in because we have a proven product, we're selling it, and I need to be working on other things in my business. Yeah, I think we're always trying to find more time for um, us to be doing the things that make money in our business, right? At least that's how I think about it. Um, uh-huh. I, I'm trying not to be the technician, but rather, you know, to find those jobs and give those outsource those things away. Would you agree though, that it's really hard to, to make your first hire? Like, is that a difficult step for most yes. farmers? I think it's the first one's always the hardest. And then after yeah. that, they just kind of grow, but knowing when that first one, now when we started the farm on central, we had a vision of exactly where we were going and we knew we needed a certain amount of people because we had other businesses. So we really needed like a lead for this. And we spent a lot of time. We ended up finding a fabulous, um, a young woman who was able to come on and work for us for two years. Um, but she, you know, she was able to really handle, and she really came in more to level two where she was already leading people because she already had had multiple years of experience. So I think that's another important thing is know who you're hiring for. That person yeah. was very different than most initial hires that was literally just bagging salad mix or, you know, weeding the carrots. So you have to know what you're looking for. And um, we love um, homeschool kids and people that are from the restaurant industry. Both of those have worked out really well for us in the past. And again, you may find something else works out for you, but in our experience and many of our businesses, both of those kind of areas have had really good success with us. One of those uh, business owners there should be able to walk you through what you need. If you want even more farming tips like this one, make sure to check out the Thriving Farmer podcast. Every week, we connect with an interesting guest from farmers, both new and experienced, talented artisans, or an industry expert sharing about how farmers can thrive. With over 250 episodes and 1 million downloads, there is an episode for everyone. Visit thrivingfarmerpodcast.com or search your favorite podcast app for Thriving Farmer. That was your farm business tip of the week. Check out the Thriving Farmer podcast with Michael Kilpatrick 
on your favorite podcast app. And now back to the show. Let's talk about some examples. How does this actually play out in the world of farming and direct-to-consumer enterprises? I have a whole bunch of potential examples. Hopefully, you will fall into at least one of these, and you might be able to imagine how this could work out in your world, okay? So let's just imagine that you're a customer at a farmer's market, and you are browsing for organic vegetables, and you spot two similar looking bunches of carrots. One is priced at $5 or $6. I want to say $6. $6 for maybe one and a half pounds of carrots uh, with beautiful tops. And the other one is $10. Now, instantly, your brain, if you're that customer, your brain has anchored at $10. And now that $6 bunch appears to be a fantastic deal and you will be more inclined to purchase it. Okay, that is a great example of the magic of price anchoring. Now, if you just have a $6 bunch of carrots on your table in some markets, people would pass them by and say, that is way too expensive for one and a half pounds or one pound of carrots. No way. But if you had that $10 price tag there, now $6 seems like a great deal. Something to test, you guys. I think this would just be a fun experiment. Okay, another example. Let's imagine that um, you are an organic, you're a farmer that you do organic fruits and vegetables. Let's just stick with the vegetable farmer for another example. And you want to try this price anchoring strategy to boost your sales. So you're going to offer... Um, let's just say some kind of premium high-priced organic fruit bundle or basket, okay? And you're going to place that alongside your regular produce that you're selling. So you will, that will be a higher-priced product. I, I'm not going to put a price here, but uh, something that maybe feels a little uncomfortable to, uncomfortable to you, but uh, it, it should definitely be a higher-priced anchor, okay? You're going to put that right alongside your normal regular produce, And when you do so, they're going to see that organic fruit, vegetable, basket, or whatever with at that price tag, that's going to become their quality anchor. And now all the other organic fruits and vegetables that are in your online store that maybe you jacked up the price for all of them a little bit, uh, a little bit higher margin. Now those seem like a fantastic deal in comparison to that high priced basket that they saw first. Okay. All right, let's let's think about a farm that offers pasture-raised organic eggs. Let's go into the egg, egg department. So let's say by setting a premium price for those eggs initially, like for us, we sell them at $6 a dozen, but I know there are some markets out there that do $8 a dozen. Kind of, so I'm just going to say, let's, let's set those prices for $8 a dozen in my little town of Toledo, okay? By doing that, I establish a high quality anchor in my customers' minds. And then if I introduce a standard grade at $6 a dozen, that's gonna seem, or $5 a dozen, that's gonna seem like a bargain compared to that $8 for the premium option. So I just want you to realize that customers aren't just, they're not just buying eggs. When they purchase from you, they are buying into the perception of quality that you have just anchored into their minds with the price. Now, let's flip the scenario. Let's suppose that you start with a lower anchor price. Let's say that you're doing, you have a little sign out that says $3 a dozen. Now, when you introduce um, a premium option of $6 for for those eggs, that is going to seem unreasonably expensive to your customers, even if you know the quality justifies the price. Because the initial anchor of $3 has, has really influenced how your products are perceived and consequently how they are valued by your customers. This is just really making this, this whole like thing when I started learning it, it made me think about 
um, all of the items that are on, in my case, in the, in the online store, um, or if you're at the farmer's market, all of the, the spread of stuff that's on your tables, like the pricing in general matters there too. Like I noticed after I started studying this and implementing it, um, I noticed that I, I just, there is nothing in my online store anymore that is below four, four dollars. Like four dollars is the absolute lowest you will find anything. And it used to be that I sold things for like 250 or three bucks. I don't even have that number there anymore. Um, and four dollars used to feel like an expensive ask. And now that is the lowest number I have. I have way higher priced things in the store. So one of the things you'll notice about this is that you may be setting this perception, anchoring in general for your customer base, a perception of quality because across the board, most of your products tend to fall along this three to four dollar range. Okay. And that has become the anchor in general for your products. So pay attention. Like when you start placing higher priced anchors, it gives you the ability to raise the price of everything slightly in your store, as long as it's not as high as that initial super tall, you know, anchor, price anchor that you've set. Um, And this is a way where you can generally then start making more revenue. Okay, let's try a few more examples. Let's consider a pasture-raised meat farm. I know I have a lot of people that listen that are meat farmers. Um, So let's just say you're going to showcase a deluxe meat bundle, and you're going to put some premium price on it. And I, unfortunately, am not educated enough to know what a premium, premium, premium price would be, right? Like this is the anchor. This is the high, high. Like it might even feel uncomfortably high for you. Now you're bundling. You've got a bundle of stuff in there, okay? You you maybe don't expect a lot of people to even go for this, but you've just got it there as the anchor, okay? So by creating that anchor, it's elevating the perceived value of your standard meat cuts that are hanging out over here by themselves solo that you can just buy a la carte, okay? Customers see the value in that premium bundle and they are more likely then to feel good about opting for your standard cuts that are also at a nice little high, high price, right? Knowing that they are getting top quality meat. And for them, it's going to feel like I'm getting it at a reasonable price. Let me talk now to all of you community supported agriculture folks, CSA farmers. Instead of presenting your standard package, why don't you try anchoring with a deluxe CSA membership? Put a high price point on it. For me, let's say that would be 1100 bucks, And then put that $580 version right next to it. And I can guarantee you, you'll have a few people that'll go for that $1,100 package, but a whole lot more people will suddenly jump on the 580 because compared to $1,100, that feels like an amazing deal. Now, if, if you do something like a four-week sampler at $125 like I do, well, wow, that seems like an even bigger steal compared to the other two numbers, right? So this is why you often see when you go, when you go to um, websites, I, I see this especially with like s- software apps, you'll often see three different pricing tiers. They'll have the beginner one priced at like 20 bucks a month, and then they'll have the middle one, which is like... a month. And then there's one that's $250 a month. And they'll often point to the middle tier and say, this is the most popular. They'll even tell you which one is the most popular. They're trying to get you to take the middle tier. That's the one they want you to buy uh, because they've done this whole continuum thing for you, right? The, The expensive one is the anchor and it helps you feel more comfortable with that middle of the road one. This is this example of the CSA package is actually something that I have started shifting in my messaging when I present my different bundles to uh, a potential CSA buyer. I now have the most expensive one at the very top. It is the first one that they see. And I used to kind of hide it. I felt like that's not the one I wanted to lead with. (laughs) And now I'm switching that strategy because I want people to see this $1,100 basket. And then that second second pricing of $580 doesn't feel ridiculous. I have one more example here. 
Uh, this is a farm dinner ticket. I remember years and years ago, we used to charge like 50 bucks for a, a pretty nice farm dinner experience at our farm. And every year, it has gone up higher and higher. And there was one foundational year that was really transformational for me in terms of thinking about pricing for this type of product when when we had who someone who I think is probably the, the best chef in Toledo, if, if not the best, then maybe the second best who said, I will come to your farm and it will be a, an intimate dinner for 15 people. It basically be like a chef's table. And he said, I want you to charge $175 a ticket for it. And it'll come with wine pairings. But I sort of choked when he said that. I was like, what? <laughs> and that was because I was used to $50 a person. And now I'm going to triple the price. And I thought in my head, like, no one's going to buy this. How am I going to do this? Well, interestingly, those 15 tickets sold out in two hours. And I, part of it I, I know was the fact that it was such a small number, but also because it was Chef Nixon. And uh, he no longer does our dinners with us anymore because he sort of switched his model. He's now moved into the baking bis- business. Uh, but we have another chef that does most of our farm to table dinners and I can tell that they want to charge more because they need to but they are struggling with this pricing mindset stuff and I've been coaching them like you could go higher like we could we could go over a hundred dollars a ticket if you want and they've been inching up every year they've been going a little bit higher a little bit higher uh, I think they started with 75 and then they just did like 90 this year and they're like do you think that would be okay <laughs> And I want to tell them, yes, yes, you can go over 100. People are going to buy it, right? And part of it is because I'm benefiting from the halo effect of this $175 a ticket price tag that we had years ago. Like that was the anchor. People remember that. So anything below that feels like an amazing deal and a steal. So this whole pricing thing, it's all marketing. Like pricing is a part of your marketing. It is helping you create a perception of quality. People are going to look at your price. If you're higher than everyone else at market, there are people walking around going, why is their price higher than everyone else's? And then the next question they're asking is, is it better? Is there something special about that? And they will want, they will long to categorize themselves with that better quality brand because it's a reflection on them, they will feel drawn to it and they will eventually pull towards you. So just don't be afraid to to push your pricing higher. And this price anchoring strategy can help you be more comfortable with that. So if you wanna raise all of your prices just a little bit more and then make one thing on your online store really high end, that's the anchor, right? That's gonna make it easier for you to raise the prices of everything because you'll you'll have this one thing that you really don't expect a lot of people to buy. It's just there to set the anchor and it's going to make everyone feel better about the other stuff in your store or on at your market stand, even if all of those things have also been raised in price a little bit. Okay. So just understanding the psychology of price anchoring, it's going to allow you to strategically position your products. So Make sure that you're choosing the right anchor price because if you get that right, you, you might have to experiment with that a little bit, shift it up or down a little bit. You can influence how customers are perceiving the value of your offerings and you will be able to guide them toward the choices you want them to make. That's really important. I want to pause there for a second. So I want you, as you're, as you're thinking about how this might look for you, I want you to decide on what's the thing you want them to buy. Where are you trying to steer them? Or what average cart value are you trying to get them at in your purchase process? And what's the pricing that you want them to pay for that? Okay. And then let that inform what do I have to, what do I have to set my price anchor product at in order to get people to come to this? 
So don't look at it as a failure when you set this high price anchor for something and nobody buys that. Don't make that mean something in your head like, oh man, it's too high. Nobody's buying it. No one's supposed to buy that. No, like a very small fraction of people will buy the thing that you set as the price anchor. Okay. The only reason it's there is to help people feel good about buying the thing you want them to buy, which you have also raised the price of. Okay. Are you tracking? That's really important. So it's not just about setting prices. This is about setting the right context for those prices. And you want to create this, this narrative that's resonating with your customers. And this is ultimately what's going to build you a very loyal customer base. Okay, so let's just um, wrap this up today by talking through a few very pr practical takeaways. I want to help you see how you could actually do this. So first, I want you to make sure that you understand your audience. Because different customers have different perceptions of value. And I don't know where you lay on the, on the map. I don't know where you are geographically in the world um, or in North America. Are you in the city? Are you in a rural America? Some of your audiences might be more price sensitive, while others are going to prioritize quality over cost. And so you want to tailor your anchor price to appeal to the different segments that are in your customer base. So you might have a couple of different types of anchor prices going on at the same time. Always, my second kind of practical takeaway here is always have something upper tiered in price, wherever you are selling, whether it's online or in person. There should always be something that feels like a stretch, that's just like, whoo, that's a lot, okay? Whether it's bundled or it's its own thing, it's, you should have something that is upper echelon. And sometimes the whole purpose of that product its only purpose and value to your brand is to serve as the price anchor. It is not necessarily there to actually be purchased, okay? Its job is to be the anchor. So that's just something I want you to think about and walk away from today. And I want you to also list that higher priced option first or maybe second, but it should be near the top. Remember how Amazon positions theirs. It's not the very first thing, but it's the second one or the third one. You wanna have that range of one or two or three items that a person views right at the beginning and that, that higher tiered thing is gonna be, become the anchor. So don't hide it down at the bottom. Your first set of prices that are listed at the top of your store or the first prices that people see when they come to your stand, that, that is gonna become your anchor. So think about what is that thing you're currently anchoring right now? Maybe you're unknowingly anchoring at a low price. And then you're trying to get people to buy your high premium meats over here and they're not taking it. And it might just be because you anchored things wrong because you didn't show that something else first, right? To make that higher price feel more comfortable. I think this, I think if some of you guys take this message today and go play around with it, I think you're going to start to see some crazy profits. Like I'm excited to hear back from you what a little bit of shifting might do in your signage and where you show the signage and when, like, I really think this could transform some of you. Okay, then take a look at your online store categories, okay? What order are you showing them in? This is another practical takeaway. Is there a certain category of products that might be more exclusive? If so, then put that category up near the top. Show it first. Let it be your price anchor. Put your budget meets at the bottom, um, just just test this out for a few weeks and, and see what you notice. So I recently had to go and update my CSA price list inside of Local Line for my early renewal campaign. And this little tip made me switch the order in which I showed my different share types. So I used to put my egg share at the top because it's the thing that everyone's trying to find when they first go in and renew. That's the the crazy thing they're all trying to grab. And I'm and I'm like, oh, no, I'm going to put that's my least expensive product out of all of the shares. <laughs> so now it's at the bottom and everything else sits above it. And the most expensive item, the large CSA share that hardly anyone buys, that is the first thing that is now sitting at the top. OK, um, but you might have like I know in local line, you have the ability to create different categories and then prices and then different 
products sit within those categories. So I have like vegetables and I have um, fruits and I have herbs. So those are some of the different kinds of categories. So I would not put my herb category at the top of my retail store because those are all really, really low priced in comparison to some of my other more higher priced things, right? That's not where, that's not the thing that I want to serve as the anchor. So think about how are you positioning your categories, but also within the categories, how are you positioning the products? So your, your most, most expensive price anchored things should be first or second. And then you've got some of your um, middle of the road, the, well, I don't want to say middle of the road, but the next level down, the things you actually want them to buy <laughs> at the price point you want, those are showing up next. And then your lower price stuff is underneath it. Okay. All right. A few other tips here. Tell your story. And the reason I bring this up is because uh, if you have things that you're trying to position as high quality premium products, um, then telling the story behind your farm and your sustainable practices and your commitment to quality, those are all integral parts of your brand and of um, making people feel good about the fact that they're buying it at this this price quality level, right? We need to use that narrative to justify our anchor price. So when customers understand the the effort and the care and the ethical practices that are going into your products, then they are more willing to pay that premium price. That price anchor doesn't look ridiculous to them. So use social media, use your website, use your emails, use your packaging materials to convey that narrative and that story. It needs to match the quality level that your anchor price is trying to communicate, okay? Focus on not just the features of your product in your messaging, but on the benefits. And I have a whole like podcast episode that I recently did about this. So I'm not going to go into the details. I want you to go back and look for it. I think it was episode 234. This is where in your narrative, as you're telling your story or as you're trying to pitch these premium products, we are not just giving the bullet points of, oh, it's grass fed. Oh, it was raised on silva pasture. Oh, it's raw honey. Like you're going to, you need to say a little bit more. You need to say, so what? So what that it's raised on silva pasture? What the heck does that mean? How is that helping me as a consumer? I have no idea what that means. I have no idea how that benefits my life. So add the little so what, which means that, right? So this is raw unfiltered honey, which means that what is the benefit for me as a human to have raw unfiltered honey? Because I don't maybe don't know. So if you can talk about those benefits as part of your messaging, then again, it positions, it helps justify that anchor price that you've put out into the world. And you're going to feel better about that anchor price. I know when I initially started a CSA and I was asking people, gosh, I think our first price long ago was $340. I remember thinking that was so much. And now I look at our price and we're, we're at 580, which is almost twice the amount. And um, how did we, how did we leap? It's the same product. It's a little bit different. It's essentially the same product in terms of the, the vegetables that are in there. But I feel really, really good about, I could actually go higher. I should have gone higher. I'm already saying that. Um, I feel really good about it because I know what transformation comes from my product. I have, I have sort of broken through this idea that I'm not just selling the vegetables. If I just computed the value of the vegetables in the box, yeah, it's $31 a box. <laughs> but that is not actually what I'm delivering. I'm delivering a life transformation. I'm delivering, you know, happy smiles at the kitchen table, like children eating weird vegetables, living out their parents' dreams. They wanted their kids to become no longer picky eaters, but people that try all kinds of cool stuff. And they want the status that comes with that. They want the feel good parent feeling of I'm being a good mom because I'm teaching my kids how to eat better. Or um, the people that just get their kicks out of cooking at the at the stove and making some concoction and taking a picture of it and putting an Instagram and all the feel good endorphins that come with that. Like that's what I'm giving people. And that's more than just $5 for a bunch of carrots. Like it's so much more, right? And I have discovered that. Like I have broken through and I understand that now that that is actually what I'm selling. That has value. That is the benefit. That is the so what behind the seven to eight vegetables in your box. 
so that you can cook a masterpiece that is better than a five-star restaurant in your town, right? That's what I'm giving. So when we can talk about that a lot in our messaging, then we feel good about the price too, because we know, hey man, this is this is going to change your world. This is, this is going to be something you would pay thousands of dollars for, you know, if I could guarantee this would happen for you. Okay, a few more tips. I, I digress. Um, another way to, to make this relevant is to try the price anchoring strategy by offering bundled packages. This is a great way to sort of step your way into this. So create packages that include both premium and standard priced objects, or not objects, products, sorry. Um, by pricing that bundle slightly lower than the total of individual items, customers are going to perceive it as a great deal. And so this not only boosts the sale of your premium products, but it also ensures that those standard products are now starting to be seen as an excellent value. Okay, so that's a, another strategy. And then finally, use limited additions or seasonal offerings to help you with this price anchoring thing because they're, they're fantastic op opportunities for price anchoring. They, they allow you to introduce a limited edition product. It's only going to be around for a few weeks and you can, you can justify a higher price for that. And when you put a higher price on it, it now highlights and emphasizes the exclusivity, the uniqueness. People are going to jump all over it. So if you have something that's only around for a little bit of time, please make it more expensive because people will buy it because it is limited. Make sure you tell them it's limited. Talk about that as you market it. An example of this is something that we're doing right now. I just tried doing this. It's called Golden Berries. And these, if you know what I'm talking about, you know they're like candy dissolving on your tongue. They're so good. Um, so we have been raising ground cherries or husk cherries for a long time. Those have taken a while to catch on, but they're now quite popular with our with our audience. And the golden berry looks a lot like a ground cherry. It's just maybe three or four times bigger, but it still comes in this husk. And it's like an explosion of, of sweet, tart. Um, it's got pineapple, a little bit of mango flavoring in there. I cannot stop eating them. Like I actually want to hoard them. I kind of don't want to share them with my customers because I just want to eat them all. They're so, so good. And we don't have loads of them. So there's this part of me that's like, do I want to give all of these away? I'm not sure I want to sell them. Anyway, I talked about these on an Instagram story and in an email to my customers. And I just went on and on about, hey, this is new. Like we've never shown these to you before. We've never grown these before. We discovered them when we were on vacation in Arizona a few years ago and they blew our minds. And now we're growing them. And oh my gosh, they're amazing. And I don't have that many. Like I just don't have many plants. So I don't have as much product. I'm going to give you what I can, but I'm, uh, as a result, this is the price. And it was a lot. I'm trying to remember what it was. I want to say it was, I want to say it was $7.50 for a pint. Okay, that's not very many. But I could do that because I didn't have very many. And I was sort of like, you know what? If nobody buys it, that's okay because this is serving as an anchor. This is serving as a, a product that's basically saying there are things in this product suite that are higher end, that are near the $10 mark. Uh, maybe not too many people buy them, but now all of a sudden all the other things that are priced at $5, average of 5 to five fifty, uh, they seem completely reasonable, right? So customers who, who value these, these um, limited edition, uniqueness, exclusivity, if they value those kind of traits, they're going to be more likely to make a purchase that's at a higher, a higher price tag, right? If they feel like they're getting something special that's not going to be around for a long time, they are way more comfortable spending a lot of money on that. So play around with things that, that are limited edition. Those are great things to serve as price anchors. Okay. Your homework today. I hope this was fun. I hope this got your mind spinning. I want you to realize that pricing is subjective. It is so subjective. It is so contextual. And we have the ability and the power to pre-frame 
how our customers are looking at all of our prices of our products, how they look at all of the quality of our general product suite based on how we price a few things in the upper tiered category. If we create a few prices and a few products that are frankly a little out there, high echelon, maybe hardly anyone buys them. That's okay. But if we can set some prices like that, it ends up raising up. It creates a halo effect for all of your other prices and it makes you able to raise everything to a higher price point and your customer feels good about buying those things. So I want you to play with this. This week, I want you to take a look at your product suite. If you're going to the farmer's market or if you have an online an online store, I want you to go in there and take a look at what you've got for sale this week. What are you offering? And I want you to go and play, reset, reset a price anchor. Using some of the strategies I, I shared with you at the very end here, go reset something at a higher price anchor Make it higher and just see what happens. And yes, it's going to feel scary, but let's just look at this as a test run. This is just a test run. This isn't forever, okay? Trust in the principle that pricing is subjective. And we want to start to reframe for our clients the quality of our product. And we do that with our pricing. We do that with our pricing. And you have the ability to shift how they feel about your product, about the quality, by simply changing the price tag for everything, jumping everything a little bit, but more importantly, setting that price anchor significantly higher, that's going to make everything else feel good to your clients. Okay. Let me know what happens. Let me know how this experiment went for you. And let me know what this experiment brought up for you. All right. That's all I got today. The show notes can be found at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 236. And if you liked today's episode, if this sort of blew your mind, (laughs) I want you to go and share it with a friend. Copy the link, send it to a farmer friend of yours and say, you got to listen to this. This is really interesting. And uh, maybe they'll get something out of it and change how they price their products too. Now, if you want to get onto my email list to get better at farm marketing, then please go and subscribe at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash subscribe. And if you did like this episode, subscribe to the show because I have a new podcast that drops every single week and I will have future episodes coming soon on pricing strategies that you maybe don't know about that you can implement and maybe start seeing a difference in your sales and in your profits. I'm also now on Instagram at my digital farmer. I love to show up there in stories, especially throughout the week. So go check me out there and see what little tip I might have to bring to you and connect with you there. And uh, I'm looking for podcast guests for the winter season. If you know anyone that you'd love to have on the show, or if you have some time now and you'd like to share with me what's what you're doing on your farm, if you have a a cool innovation in marketing, or if you just want to come onto the show and have us talk about your business, we can kind of audit your sales funnel and people can learn from you. Please reach out to me at mydigitalfarmers at gmail.com and we can see if it'd be a good match. Thanks so much for joining me today. I will catch you next time for another episode. Bye-bye.